Andrew nodded in understanding. That's why her neuroanatomy remained unrepaired. She must have been younger when it happened, and there were no transports to take her back to a settled planet with proper facilities. Or perhaps the damage was beyond repair. He touched his own head. No fixing me, he said aloud. But you do need to leave. I might have already killed your parents. Mariella frowned deeply at him, then rushed past him, back toward the hallway in the mine. Wait, Andrew shouted. There could be... Before he could finish his sentence, his future mind pressed forward, demanding his attention. A swarm of insane people was emerging from the tunnels in the mine, rushing toward where he stood in the vision. He saw Mariella, who he was chasing. They paid her no mind, pushing past her on both sides. Then he saw an empty liquid gas tank tip over at the passing of some clumsy madwoman and fall onto Mariella, stunning her. Andrew was frozen in his decision as the vision of himself being smothered by bodies began to fade. The former workers seemed to ignore the girl, for what reason he could not guess, though he suspected some familiarity that persisted despite the stupefied state. But at the same time, she was in real danger. He broke his paralysis and ran after Mariella. Fear began to tighten his throat, and he broke into a sweat in his temperature-regulated suit. Normally, his future visions gave him something tangible to avoid, or could guide him in some way, but this one gave him only his demise. He supposed as he ran down the hallway, following the echo of footsteps, that he could turn back and avoid the situation entirely, but he felt a stronger duty to persist. Mariella could be saved, he was sure. He began down the stairwell, trying his best to avoid slipping on the remnants of old food wrappers. He heard the sound of more footsteps and knew the horde, likely awakened by his scuffle earlier, was inbound. The lights in the stairwell flickered and went out. He was in near total darkness. The only light was from behind him, but below him, his own shadow blocked all. He flipped on the flashlight on his bottom lug rail. He fell backwards with the shock, hitting the stone stairs heavily. Below him was a swarm of people groping forward, climbing over one of their number that was struggling on the bottom stair. Hold him! Hold him! came one of their voices from the noisy den, and Andrew knew this lot, though clearly mad, was cognizant enough to be something more dangerous than a herd of animals. Their mouths were twisted and wide, their skin pale and taut, but a dark light was in their eyes, which refracted and defied the blinding whiteness of the gun's light, even as their pupils drank it up. Andrew's nerves unwound. He hadn't been surprised, truly surprised, in a very long time. Without thought, he pulled the trigger of his rifle, firing a single shot into the stone wall that went ricocheting down the stairwell. His earplugs deadened the sound immediately, but the conscious insane humans before him lacked such tactical protection. They screamed and wailed in unison. It was a sickening sound to Andrew, but it gave him time to hastily flip the safety over to Otto and fire wildly into the throng of attackers. Blood sprayed up onto his suit, onto his face, the warmth of it sickened him, shattering his resolve even as it brought howling laughter from within. The screaming intensified. The bolt locked open. With trembling fingers, Andrew dropped the magazine and slammed in another. He tried to master himself, watching the remaining bodies in the bright circle of light in front of him. He fired another burst, perhaps ten rounds, into the motion before him, then forced himself to toggle back to semi. The light trembled before him, and he willed it to stay motionless bodies below him were still or sliding backward. There were fewer than there ought to have been, meaning that some had fled, surely awaiting him down below, if he dared to try to retrieve the girl. He took a breath and slowly worked his way downward, avoiding the bleeding bodies. One still twitched, its face contorted and ticking around vacuous, dead eyes. The image seemed to burn into Andrew's retinas, a memory at which his old self seemed to smile inwardly. Near the bottom of the stairwell, his future mind kicked in again, revealing the waiting attack from both his right and left, the madman hiding behind piles of discarded equipment. In the vision, he saw the remaining group standing back, fearful near one of the tunnels. As the vision faded, Andrew's present mind quickly formulated a strategy. He reached to his back and retrieved his plasma gun. He balanced its considerable girth in his left hand and quickly double-checked the battery life. The indicator on its white metal case glowed a bright green. 
It was a clever death tool, compact and efficient, but he didn't trust it in an atmosphere unless he had no choice. He stepped out into the open cavern and pointed his guns out to his left and right. Looking ahead to find the rest of his enemies, he fired a burst from each weapon blindly. The roar of the plasma gun almost overwhelmed the loud rifle, its energy ripping apart the nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere at a molecular level. But the report from each weapon indicated impact with flesh. He saw the remaining miners, then glanced left and right to see a dead man on each side. The one on his left was burned nearly black and smoking. The stink sent a wave of nausea over him, but his old self suddenly pushed a finger of insanity up into Andrew's psyche, which quelled the need to vomit and hardened him temporarily. Andrew dropped his plasma gun, letting it hang around his shoulder by its bungee strap, then sighted the last group. They were rushing at him, ignoring Mariella as if she were an inanimate object, though she reached out her hands as if trying to stop and slow them. They swarmed around, knocking the girl roughly down, paying her no notice. Andrew was back in control now, and he didn't need the faint early images from his prescient mind to tell him what to shoot. He carefully executed each rushing man and woman, tapping each one in the chest twice. Six fell as they ran. Ten. Twelve. The last one took one shot in the shoulder and the rifle was empty. Andrew let go of the rifle and picked up his plasma gun. The man was almost upon him, blood pouring from his single wound. Andrew could see his face, which was both confused and angry. With two air-burning shots, Andrew obliterated the man, turning him into a smoking corpse with two gaping wounds seared through him. The man's face was plastered in a slightly sad expression as he fell. Andrew had a flashback. He saw the man sitting near Mariella in an office, talking calmly. The girl seemed not to notice the conversation and stared at her hands. Mariella, let's go, Andrew said. You see, you can't stay here. He was mad. They all were. And I can tell you, there was no cure. Mariella picked herself up, shocked at the carnage surrounding her. Tears were welling up in her open, trembling eyes. Andrew gave her an appraising stare. He looked down at the blood, which was running between the forgotten prepackaged snacks piled at the bottom of the stairs. His mind was blank, unable to think of the next step as he looked upon the gory horror of his handiwork. The stoic lane that he piloted his psyche through was suddenly no longer straight, but was like a winding path. He felt no immediate disgust or fear, but all around him, the feelings pressed in. All he really knew was that he had to escape the sight, escape, or else succumb and lose what control he still had. Hesitantly, willing his voice to work, he said, I'm going to the elevators. His voice died like sand spilling on stone. He choked slightly. Silently, he considered carrying Mariella out by force, but the warm liquid running underfoot unnerved him. He turned and walked hurriedly up the stairs, gripping the handrail on his left in case he slipped in the blood, which was running in torrents over the stone steps. In some places, the puddles on the uneven stairs were deep enough to lap over the tops of his composite boots. He let his rifle slide to behind his right hip and continued holding his plasma gun in his right hand. He wanted the escape from the grisly scene even more than he wanted to reload, for it was more than a sight. It was a beacon, and he feared the one who would heed it the one who laughed in the cold recesses between his footsteps. When he reached the top of the stairs, he traded his weapons, traded his magazine for a fresh one, then started back toward the lift, refusing to turn and watch the stairs. As he walked, another part of his mind pushed forward with a vision, though he couldn't be sure which. He was sitting alone in the cockpit of his ship, calm and without fear. It faded, as he neared the lift car, dissipating into hazy memory as quickly as it had come. It stood open, just as he had left it, a lighthouse to the floundering ship of his mind, beaten by waves of emotion. He reached the control terminal and sighed, leaning against the wall. He looked out at the track through the lift car window, watching it fade into night. The running lights disappeared into the twisting rock further out, hiding the points beyond. He could not bear to wonder what was out there, which was just as well, as he had decided he would leave without finding his mark. He simply could not endure any longer. The girl he was supposed to find was just that, a girl, and he had thus far seen only adults, save for Mariella, 
who hardly qualified as such. The children were likely dead. He had a sudden echo of the horror of the first floor along with laughter from his old self. Or else were in the sixth sector, along with the rest of the colonists. And their minds were surely gone. He turned and looked back at the empty space of the landing and the tunnel to the mine. Mariella had not followed him. He looked at the panel and considered leaving Mariella, but despite the emotional detachment he had developed over the fractured months, he felt horror at the threat of guilt of such a decision. Guilt in the moment washed over him as he considered that he left her amid his carnage, as if she were a child throwing a tantrum, refusing to come when bidden, not a grown woman who had witnessed the death of a dozen people she had known since childhood. And she had not followed. Of course, she would not leave. Not if she would walk headstrong into the hive of monsters without a care. Andrew banged his fist against his head. What's wrong with you? He stepped away from the elevator, hearing a beep from his computer, alerting him to an unexpected jump in his blood pressure and pulse. He reached the stairwell, whose lights were now flickering, threatening to return to some semblance of life. To his relief, Mariella was walking up the stairs. In the high contrast of the flickering lights, he could almost pretend the floor was black, not crimson, covered with oil rather than blood. I'm glad you're coming, he said. She raised her eyes to look at him and frowned with anger. I'm sorry, he said, and stepped back to let her pass. She turned back toward the office and began walking quickly. The elevators are back this way, he said. She ignored him. He sighed. He would have to carry her out after all. Leaving her would be unacceptable. Horrific. He started after her. When he reached the office space, he found Mariella emptying some drawers and pulling out various items from beneath an aluminum desk, then stuffing them into a backpack. She pulled out a sponge cake from the bag, opened the wrapper and bit down into it, and then walked toward Andrew. Andrew frowned with realization. You got everything? Mariella nodded then walked past him, chewing the snack cake noisily. Andrew skipped a step to keep up. It was you that left all that food at the bottom of the stairs. She glanced at him and nodded. Why? She put the snack cake in her mouth and rubbed her stomach. Andrew thought a moment. You came here and left it for the... people below? She nodded. They stopped eating the food. She nodded again. But you kept coming down here anyway. Mariella continued to nod. You got it from the main dormitories. That's why so many machines were empty. She looked at him and nodded curtly. If you could have put out the beacon for help the whole time, why didn't you? He remembered and corrected himself. Unless you don't know how to pull the alarm, or... Mariella shook her head and then pointed to her temple. You didn't because you didn't want to lose your parents? He shook his head. Oh, it's probably better you didn't call for help. Whoever came would be enslaved. Andrew trailed off and looked hard at Mariella. She didn't respond to his monologue. She walked quickly to the elevator and began working the computer terminal outside it. The doors opened. Willing to leave now? Mariella stared at him. She finished the last of the cake then scribbled in her notebook and showed it to Andrew. They won't come out now. They haven't eaten food in a long time. There are more people down there still, hiding. She nodded. Do your parents notice you? Do they acknowledge you? Mariella looked sadly at him and shook her head. It's the Wurtla. What they were? They're gone. Mariella scribbled. I know. Then, what's a Wurtla? Wurtla, Andrew said, trying to drop the vowels and pronounce the title he had learned from his contact with. He could not remember its proper name, just its title. He motioned to the elevator. Mariella stepped in and he followed. He watched her punch up the dormitories. The car started moving, lurching from its resting place, squeaking as it slowly began its ascent. Mariella pointed again to her notebook. What's a Wurtala? Andrew thought a moment. It's an ancient monster. A demon. A devil. He shook his head. Something beyond such concepts. 
They don't do it justice. It can control the minds of humans, turn them mad. It eats sanity like food. A long time ago, nobody who knows anything about the Wurtla knows exactly how long, but we think close to a hundred thousand Earth years, they were imprisoned by a race of beings that could compete with their power. Angels, maybe, but they left nothing behind. The Wurtla were placed deep within planets like this one, hopefully to be forgotten by man. Whatever they are, my guess is they are immortal on some level, but clearly not powerful enough to escape a prison of rock. But their powers can leak through, touching the minds of people. Maybe they've been coming through for a long time, calling mankind down, back to them. Some primeval song without words or melody. We hear it between the words of thought. Out in space. Andrew was clenching his hands as he talked. They can whisper, too, if you get too close. And once they get in, you'll be their slave. And if you escape, you'll go mad. Trust me, I know. He was waiting for her to ask him how he knew. He dreaded the question because within it was the explanation of his power, but also of the madman that lurked within him, ready to take control and wreak havoc. He laughed inside, and not the old Andrew. Madman! Ha! He was already a madman, with four minds living inside him, constantly trying to be the one true mind, constantly talking behind each other's backs. Some part of him wanted her to ask him. He needed confession. He longed for it. But she didn't ask him. Instead, she wrote in her notebook again, I haven't heard any whispers. I'm not insane. You'd have to be a little crazy to keep coming down to feed those people, Andrew said. She wrote, What else should I have done? Andrew shrugged. Did any of the others acknowledge you? Notice your existence? She shook her head. Weird. I think the unprotected part of my mind can hear the thing inside the rock whispering, practically screaming, or singing. What is it saying? Andrew opened up to his old self for a few moments. Lots of things. Kill, mostly. But you don't have to worry about me. Like I said, it only whispers to the unprotected part of my mind, and it's locked away safely. Andrew bit his lip. He did need confession. He made up his mind to see a priest when he got out of this, though he wondered if the priest would understand and would actually be willing to help him pray, help him find forgiveness. Old Andrew was balking at him at the thought. A priest? You think he knows God? The car rocked as it passed a beam in the dark. Mariella scribbled. Why did you come here? To get me? No, but I won't leave someone behind who can be saved. She pointed at the notebook again. I came to save a little girl named Vivian Toro. I was hired by her father, Saul Toro. I don't think I'll be able to finish the job, though. I know her, little girl. She's probably dead by now. I wasn't dead. You're immune. That is, if you really don't hear the voice. You're an adult. If Vivian was immune, there was nobody to care for her. Mariella frowned and then wrote quickly, You're a coward. Andrew flushed slightly. I can't feasibly search every cranny of this mine. It's not possible as one man. You know she's on level six. The rest are. I don't know that. Mariella touched the panel and the lift car stopped, swinging in the abyss. She pointed to the notebook again. I have a responsibility to you now. I must see you to safety first. She sighed as she wrote. I was already safe. You won't be if I had to level six. They don't pay attention to me. She was getting tearful as she pointed to her words. She grunted in exasperation and went to the panel. The car started moving back. Andrew saw she had punched in level six. He sighed and stepped over, but she slapped his hand as he reached for the panel. Quickly, she unplugged it from the wall. I can just plug the monitor back in. She shook her head. She wrote again, I know the way. Andrew sighed. He remembered her standing still while the vile people of the mine swarmed past her, 
bent on him. Perhaps she was right, and they would ignore her. Where is the closest security station? Any weapon storage? Mariella smiled asymmetrically. The left side of her face seemed unwilling to go with the rest. She kneeled and plugged the monitor back in. With a few strokes, they were headed back up.